Good evening, Orange Avenue family. We just welcome you back to our Wednesday night summer series. Tonight's speaker is Nathan House. I had the pleasure of uh, working with Nathan down at Concord Street in Orlando for about two years. He quickly became one of my best friends in the entire world. The reason why is because he has an evident love for people and for spreading the gospel, but is also an incredibly deep teacher of God's word. A quick story about Nathan before we hop into our lesson. Uh, probably the first week that Nathan came to work with us at Concord Street, me and him went out to eat the Lord's Chicken at Chick-fil-A. And, um, and I sat down, I got my food first, and then Nathan got his food second. I sat down and I just waited and waited and waited for Nathan to, uh, to get there to eat with me. And before I actually looked up and saw Nathan over at another person's table, and uh, I got up to walk over because I thought maybe he got lost and forgot what I looked like. But no, Nathan was just spreading the gospel. He was teaching somebody about the gospel and, invi and inviting them to church. And from that moment on, I knew that Nathan was a guy that I had to not only learn from, but surround myself with. So I hope you enjoy the lesson tonight. Uh, just a heads up, it's a little long because Nathan teaches a long time. But I want you to dig in, uh, open up your Bibles, and just join with us in study tonight. Love you, Orange Avenue. Good afternoon. My name is Nathan House, and I am the minister for the Houston Church of Christ in Houston, California, quite a ways away from you guys. Uh, but I, I was asked by Kenny if I could put together a lesson for your guys' summer series and was honored to do so. So without any uh, further wasting of my time, I'm going to go ahead and, and your time and go ahead and start with our lesson tonight. So I'm going to be talking about encounters with God, which of course is what you guys are studying. And I want to begin here. This is not what we're going to set up for most of our time, but I want to begin in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul was on a second missionary journey. And as he's traveling on his missionary journey, he comes to the city of Athens. And we remember the story very well as he's traveling through Athens. He comes into the city and there's all these idols and he talks about this one unknown God. And he talks about that with them. And so uh, as he's here in the city of Athens, he, he has this encounter with a group of men, a group of philosophers known as Epicureans. He also has an encounter with Stoics, but I want to draw your attention for a moment to the Epicureans. So he's talking with the Ep Epicurean philosophers. Now, the Epicureans, let me go ahead and pull this up. This is the Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. Uh, the Epicureans uh, come, came from this Greek philosopher uh, before Jesus Christ a couple hundred years. And no, notice this, Epicurus held that the senses, as the one and only source of all our ideas, provided the sole criterion for all truth. Now notice this, he did not reject the existence of gods, and again, notice multiple gods, not monotheism. He did not reject the existence of gods, but refused to concede their interference in human affairs. See, he taught that the gods uh, were not near to their huma to humanity. They were not near to creation, that the gods were far off, removed from humanity. And so this was a very significant teaching. And as Paul's going through the city of Athens and he's encountering these Epicureans, it's interesting to note some of the things he says here. In chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. So Paul here talks about God, the creator. He doesn't live in temples uh, made by man's hands. He, he's not something that humans created. Uh, in verse 26, he says, he made, so God made. Instead of being created by man's hands, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of all the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So as Paul's talking to these group, this group of philosophers, one of the things he's telling them is that this creator God, who created all mankind, he's not, he's not like your idols that's created, you know, that's fashioned by human hands. He's not like your idols that he needs you to come in and worship him in your man-made temples. He's not like them. He doesn't live in temples made by hands. Instead, he's drawing a contrast. He says that this God, he's the one who has done all, he's the one who's done all the creating. He's the one who has done all the, all the creative work. And then he tells them that they need to seek God, verse 27, that they need to seek God and perhaps feel their way towards him and find him. Yet this is where it gets, you know, I think most interesting, especially as it applies to the Epicureans. Yet he is actually 
not far from each one of us. You know, they were teaching he was that they got that the gods were far off, removed from humanity. Paul comes on the scene and says that's not the case. They're not removed from humanity. You know, we live in a world sometimes we feel like, you know, we sometimes wonder where's God, right? Things are crazy and hectic and things have been, you know, very a uh, great deal of turmoil recently has hasn't there. A lot of it can be discouraging at times. Some of the things we've gone through with the riots and the pandemic and all of these things and and perhaps some people might begin to look at this and might begin to say where is God? You know, where is he? The apostle Paul says he's actually he may not feel this way sometimes. He's actually not far from each one of us. What an amazing statement. He's actually not far from each one of us. You know, the, old, the, whole, the whole of scriptures is trying to demonstrate this very important concept that we have a God who is near to his creation. We have a God who is near to humanity. You know, there's nothing that God, nothing that God did that demonstrated this point any greater than the coming of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the greatest demonstration, right, of a God who was near to his creation. You know, we go to passages like that we're familiar with, like John chapter 1. We're familiar with this, of course. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that passage. And we know verse 14, right? And the Word, the Word who was in the beginning, the Word who was with God, the Word who was God, verse 14, that Word became flesh. He became humanity and dwelt among us. What an interesting phrase, isn't that? You know, again, nothing demonstrates God's desire to be near his humanity, near his creation, near humanity. Nothing demonstrates it more than this. I mean, Matthew would write in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, right? That they would call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And here we see in John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt is the same word that we get the, the word for tent or for tabernacle. And so it's interesting to think about for a second in that, in that regards. The Word became flesh and He pitched His tent among our tents. The Word became flesh and He put His tabernacle among us. You know, the tabernacle in the Old Testament, that's where they went to see God, to meet, to meet God. The temple was where they went to meet God. And the Word became flesh and He pitched His tent among us. Obviously, nothing demonstrates God's care uh, God's desire to be near humanity. Nothing demonstrates that as much as a Savior who came to earth to dwell among us. He, he, he came to earth. He didn't distance himself socially. He didn't distance himself uh, physically. He touched the lepers. He invited the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, to come and be with him. He had little children who nobody else had time for little children, but he did. He was physically here. He was, he, he was ready to be engaged by humanity. He was ready to be with humanity. He received the poor. All of these things demonstrate the, the, the desire of God to be near his creation, the desire of God to be near humanity. Yet, while the New Testament teaches this, obviously, the, with the greatest clarity in the incarnation of Christ, all through the Old Testament and all through other parts of the New Testament, this concept of a God who wants to be near his creation is just constantly seen. It's always there. You know, there's clear teachings of this. When you open up Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, and we see God walking with them in the garden. When we see God listening to the cries of His people. You know, sometimes we see God encountering them, His people through a vision or a dream. Uh, sometimes He encounters them in, in different ways, through physical manifestations or through one-on-one -on -one conversations. But all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, we see God encountering His people. And today I want to look at one of those uh, encounters in the Old Testament. I want to go to the book of Exodus in chapter 2. And, and I want to draw your attention uh, to a story that you're familiar with, of course. The story of Moses and the bush and the fire. We know this story, don't we? But before we get into chapter 3, we need to kind of back up in chapter 2 here a little bit. And again, you know, we all know this, but chapter breaks, the verses, they were not in the text originally. They were added, and sometimes, you know, they're obviously handy, you know, when you're wanting to find a passage, but sometimes they break up the flow of thought, and the continuity of thought can sometimes be lost a little bit because of those chapter breaks and verses, 
But chapter 2 and chapter 3 and chapter 4, it's a flowing thought that all fits together. So before we get into chapter 2, I mean 3, let's look at chapter 2 for a, mo a moment. And so notice here when it's talking about Moses. Moses has now grown up. He's grown up in the house of the Pharaoh in, 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 as an Egyptian. Yet he knows he's not an Egyptian. He knows that he is a Jew. He knows that he is an Israelite. And it says here in chapter 2, verse 11, One day when Moses had grown up, <clears throat> he went out to his people. And see how he dis they, they, he's distinguished. He went out to his people and looked on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He knew where he belonged, if you will. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. He knew who he was. And seeing his people mistreated, he strikes down this Egyptian. He hides them in the sand. But later on when this event becomes known, it says in verse 15, When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And so here we see, though, what I want you to see from this chapter 2 is that Moses wanted to deliver his people. Moses wanted to deliver the Israelites from this Egyptian slavery. He wanted to save them. And again, notice this word that I've highlighted in blue. He looked on their burdens. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So he looked on their burdens. He saw these things. And then he acted on their behalf in verse 12. Uh, again, he didn't act in the right way on their behalf. But he acted on their behalf in verse 12. But then in verse 15, he was afraid because the Pharaoh heard and he was seeking to kill him. And so he flees. He runs away. And he leaves and goes into the wilderness where he's going to live for 40 more years in the wilderness. He's going to be gone from Egypt for 40 years. And then he's come down here to the end of this chapter. And it says in verse 23, During those days, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. The same word, that's the same root word, the same Hebrew root word, where Moses was looking and seeing, God is seeing also. Moses wanted to deliver when he saw these things. God saw these things and God heard their cry and God wanted to deliver. And it says, and God knew. That's an interesting phrase also. God knew what was going on in their lives. God knew the afflictions. You know, God knows what's going on in our lives. God hears our cries. God sees our afflictions. God knows what you're going through. Whatever you're going through, God knows. If you're going through a messy divorce, God knows. If you're going through a difficulty at work, God knows. If you're going through health problems, God knows. And God knew these things. God saw the people of Israel. God heard their groanings. And it says God remembered his covenant. God remembers the promises that he's made us today. Just like he remembered in verse 24. God remembers the promises. God has given us some beautiful promises in scriptures. God remembers those promises. God remembers the promises. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And the thing is, is God remembers them. But we need to remember them. We need to remember those promises as well. And it says, God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. And so then we come into chapter 3. And we're going to see Moses' encounter with God in chapter 3. Now, these encounters that we see in Scripture, they are life-changing events in the lives of these people. This is a life-changing event in the life of Moses. A life-changing encounter with God. Moses would never be the same again. That doesn't mean he was immediately ready for everything God was asking him to do. It doesn't mean he was really excited about going along with it. He wasn't. But Moses would never be the same man again. These types of events, these types of encounters are all through the scriptures. The call of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, the call of Gideon in Judges. The call of Ezekiel in chapter 1. The call of... Peter, Andrew, James, and John to leave behind what they were doing and come stop being fishermen and being and becoming fishers of men. Their lives were forever changed. The Apostle Paul, he was not the Apostle Paul. He was the killer of Christians. He was Saul, Saul of Tarsus. But in Acts chapter 9, he has an encounter with God and he becomes the greatest, one of the greatest apostles, one of the greatest men this world has ever seen because he had an encounter with God. 
And so we come to chapter 3 of the book of Exodus, and we're going to see this encounter. Let's go ahead and read uh, verses 1 and 2 at this time. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And so let's talk about those verses for a second. Uh, This is called a theophany. God taking upon God taking a, a physical presence, a physical manifestation of God. Uh, these theophanies occur several times in scriptures. Uh, they they were they're temporary. God didn't become a permanent fiery bush. It was a temporary manifestation of God, uh, as He calls Moses here. And so let's notice that a couple of things here, and I want you to draw your attention here to verse two. It says the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Now that's the same root word that we saw back here, where God saw. It's the same root word where Moses saw. And I want you just to notice that all of these in the blue are all that same root word. Uh, Moses, sorry, the angel of the Lord appeared appeared to Moses in a flame of fire. Come down here and look at verse 16. So God is now talking to Moses, and he says, Go gather the elders of Israel together. Say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me. So God says to Moses here, the Lord, the God of your fathers, has appeared to you. So is, is, the, is the Lord different than the God of their fathers? No. This is, you know, this is what we would call Yahweh, right? The name of God. And so he introduces himself as the Lord, Yahweh, God of your fathers. So the God of your fathers, it's equivalent to Yahweh. They're, they're the same being. They're the same person. Yahweh The God of your fathers appeared to Moses. Tell him that, Moses. Tell him that Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. Now Moses comes into chapter 4, and Moses says, What if they don't believe that you appeared to me? What if they say the Lord, what if they say Yahweh didn't appear to you? Then God says, I'm going to help them to believe. And we'll talk about this more in a moment. I'm going to help them to believe that the Lord, verse 5, The God of their fathers has appeared to you. I'm going to help them believe this. I'm going to help them be convinced by this. I want to draw your attention back to this idea, though. It's kind of interesting here. Who appeared to Moses? Well, according to verse 2, it was the angel of the Lord. According to uh, verse, uh, what do we have see here? According to verse 16, it was Yahweh the God of his fathers. According to chapter 4, it was Yahweh, God of the fathers. So who was it? Was it Yahweh? Was it God? Was it the angel of the Lord? Let me suggest to you that they're all the same. The angel of the Lord is deity. It is God. It is Yahweh. We see the word angel and we sometimes, uh, we apply to it a very narrow definition of the word. And we're thinking Michael and Gabriel, but the word is more broad than that. And it can have a broader range of meanings. And here the angel of the Lord is clearly deity. Who appeared to him? Yahweh, God of your fathers. He's called the angel of the Lord in verse 2. And it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And then you come to this phrase and we see in verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the midst of the bush. Now the ESV, I love the ESV, but I don't like what they do here. They don't translate the same phrase as identical. The same phrase, midst of the bush, is the same phrase here. They, don't, they, they drop it a little bit. They change it a little bit. I wish they didn't. But it's the same phrase. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. God called to him out of the midst of the bush. Who is it that's calling to him out of the midst of the bush? Who is it that appeared to him out of the midst of the bush? It's the angel of the Lord, which is God himself, which is Yahweh And so here we have this encounter, this theophany, God taking upon himself this physical manifestation. And he appears to Moses. And then notice here, uh, look with me at verse 7, where God is speaking to Moses. And he says, then the Lord said, so this is again, when when you see all capitals like this, when it's all capitals, that's Yahweh. Sometimes you'll see it all capitals with God. It'll be all capitals, capital G, capital O, capital D. That's also Yahweh. And so when you see all capitals, just remember that that's the Hebrew word for God's name, Yahweh, or 
however we however it was pronounced, we're not sure. But it says in verse 7, Then the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering. Now we saw back here a minute ago, it says, And God knew. Now we see it again, it says in chapter 3, verse 7, And God knows their suffering. God knew, chapter 2, verse 25. I know their suffering, chapter 3, verse 7. I have seen their affliction. I have heard their cry. I know their suffering. And we come to verse 9, and it says, And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression. God has seen what they were going through. God saw the afflictions of his people. God saw the oppression that they were receiving at the hand of the Egyptians. God saw these things. God heard their cry, and God knew what they were going through. Again, all of these words in the blue are all the same root word in the Hebrew, right? I've seen their afflictions. I've seen what they're going through. Back in chapter 2, we saw that Moses saw these things. God saw these things. So we see that we see from this just real quickly that we have a God who sees, don't we? We have a God who sees. I'm going to pause from Exodus for a second. We'll come right back. I want to hop over to another encounter in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 16, where Abraham's handmaiden, Hagar, now you may remember the story of Sarah and her handmaid Hagar. Anyways, Abraham's Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, who becomes Abraham's concubine, his wife, uh, she flees. She flees. She, she runs away. And she comes into the wilderness. And here in the wilderness, she has an encounter with God. And it says, verse 13, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. You are a God of seeing. Verse 4, for she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Laharoi. Now what's super interesting is this, the idea of a God who sees is in and of itself a wonderful and beautiful idea. But what she's highlighting here, what this text is highlighting, is that she calls him, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you this in a second. So it's translated in the ESV, you are a God of seeing. But if you notice the footnote, tells us that it could also be translated as, you are a God who sees me. You're a God who sees me. And the thing is, is that idea is reflected in the very next verse. You are, a, therefore I have seen him who, what? watch this, who looks after me. You are a God who sees me. I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called, watch this, Look at. hopefully you can see it on the screen, the well was called Bir Laharoi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. You see in her encounter, her encounter was different than Moses's, wasn't it? Very different. Different purpose. A different encounter. But she came away with something that's beautiful, that's demonstrated here in Genesis 16, that's demonstrated in Exodus chapter 3, that God sees not just us, but God sees me. God sees me. God sees you. And so we come back to our text in the book of Exodus. And we come back to our text here. And we see this idea of a God who sees me. But I also want to draw your attention to something else. Not only does God see them, and he, has, he encounters them through a visual you know, his appearance and, he, and what he sees, we also see that God spoke to them over and over, over Moses and God. There's a conversation that occurs. This encounter, it was God speaking to Moses. Look at what it says in verse 4. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Now, again, back to what we saw a moment ago, out of the midst of the bush, right? God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then, then he said, so God now is speaking to Moses. He says, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. You're standing on holy ground, Moses. Take off your shoes. God speaks to Moses. You're standing on holy 
ground. If you like to cross-reference passages, cross-reference this with Joshua chapter 5, where Joshua, Moses' uh, successor, right, he has a, a similar encounter in Joshua chapter 5. As Joshua is going to go to the city of Jericho, he's ready to do battle, and he encounters this being, and Joshua asks him, are you on my side? Are you on my team or their team? And this being says, you got it wrong, Joshua. I have come as commander of the Lord's army. You, and so essentially, Joshua, you can be on my side. I'm not on your side necessarily, but you can be on mine. I have came as commander of the Lord's army. And then this being tells Joshua, take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. What made the ground holy in Exodus 3? What made the ground holy in Joshua 5? It was because in both cases, God was present. The commander of the Lord's army, as you read Joshua 5, you'll read through that text, you'll see that this being is deity. Remember, chapter breaks are not always good. Read chapter 5, and then it flows right into chapter 6. And you can see this again in chapter 6 of Joshua. So Joshua has a similar encounter. Take your shoes off. You're standing on holy ground. And so God encounters Moses this way. Take your shoes off, Moses. The place you're standing is holy. And then verses 6 through 10, God continues to speak to him, tells him, I'm the God of your father. Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. Uh, verse 7, we already read, I've seen the affliction. Now watch verse 8. So I've seen the affliction. I've heard the cry. I know their suffering. Verse 8, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them up, to bring them up out of that land to a good land, a broad land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites. Verse 9, and now behold, the cry of the people of Israel have come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. And then he, this, is, this was the purpose of the encounter. Verse 10, this is the reason God encountered Moses. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. That was the purpose of this encounter. To call Moses to a work. To call Moses to a task. Come Moses, I will send you to Pharaoh. So God reminds Moses in verses, uh, in these verses, verses 6 and 7 and 8, that, that he sees what they're going through. He hears their cry. He knows what they're going through. And he's going to deliver them. He's going to bring them up out of a place. And then we come into verse 12, where God promises Moses, I'm going to be with you, Moses. Verse 11, Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Remember, he was afraid of the last Pharaoh. He fled. Who am I? I've been gone for 40 years. Nobody knows me. I'm a nobody. I'm a shepherd. That I should go to Pharaoh? I'm nobody. And God says, I, but I will be with you. I'll be with you, Moses. So God promises Moses in this encounter, his presence. He calls him to the work and he promises him, I'll be with you. I'll be with you, Moses. And then in verses 14 through 22, God promises to act. God promises to act on behalf of his people. We'll come back and talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But in verses 14 through 22, he promises that he will get involved, and he talks about it in, in a more specific way, what he will do. Now let's go on to chapter 4. We'll come back again, as I said, in a moment. So in chapter 4, again, the story does not break. It's the same story. Moses answers, but behold, they will not believe me. So notice this word idea of believe here in this chapter. What if they will not believe me or listen to my voice? They will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then notice what he says in verse 2. What is in your hand, Moses? Moses said, it's a staff. Just throw it on the ground. So he throws it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses ran from it. That's exactly what I would have done. I hate snakes. Uh, living in Florida, you guys got scary snakes. Uh, I don't like snakes. They're terrifying. I, I would have ran from a snake too. Moses ran from this snake. That's good common sense. If you are not running from a snake, you got something wrong up ahead. I mean, I'm joking. You <laughs> maybe, but I run from a snake. Maybe you don't. But I run from a snake. Moses ran from it. Verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and grab it by the tail. Grab the snake, Moses. Boy, that would have been a hard one for me to obey. But Moses obeys. He puts out his hand, catches it. It becomes a staff in his hand. Verse 5, why, did God, why was God doing this? He tells us, he, and this goes back to the New Testament. What is the purpose of miracles? 
What's the purpose of miracles in Scripture, in the New Testament, here in this passage? What's the purpose of miracles? It's to make this message that sounds crazy. It's to verify that message. I always talk about with our teens here, with our congregation here, I'm always telling them an outrageous claim needs outrageous evidence. This is an outrageous claim. Moses is going to come to them, and he's going to tell these people, God of our fathers appeared to me. I've been, I've been a shepherd for the last 40 years. Remember how I ran off? Uh, but I've been shepherding, and the Lord appeared to me in a flame of fire in a bush. And they're going to say, you're crazy, Moses. You, you've been out in the wilderness too long. But you see, the purpose of miracles is to confirm a message. It's to validate a claim. You know, when you talk about the New Testament and Jesus Christ, it, it, is, it is an absolutely crazy claim that a carpenter from the city of Nazareth is a son of God. That is crazy. You're trying to tell me that a carpenter from the, no, from the nothing city of Nazareth, you're trying to tell me that that carpenter from Nazareth is a son of God? Absolutely. Then you better have some powerful evidence. And you know what? With some powerful evidence, an empty tomb. That's powerful evidence. So Moses here, God is trying to show Moses through miracles. He's trying to demonstrate that these miracles confirm what I'm telling you. They'll, they're confirming it in, for you, Moses. They're going to confirm it for them as well. These miracles will confirm the message that I'm sending. And he says again, so let's keep reading this. This is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then God said, put your hand back inside your cloak. So he put his hand back inside his cloak. And when he took it out, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. So then God is just trying to remind Moses, Moses, I'm going to be with you. He promised him that in chapter 3, verse 12. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to help those people believe that I appeared to you. And here in this text in chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 9, there's actually five imperative verbs. Imperative verb is a verb that commands. So there's five imperative verbs that God gives to Moses. Throw the cert, throw it on the ground. Pick up. Uh, pick up the thing by the tail, stick your hand. All these are imperative verbs, God commanding Moses. Why is God commanding Moses the, in, these, in this passage? Number one, to demonstrate his power to Moses. Number two, to reassure Moses that he was going to be with him. And number three, he was teaching Moses to, to obey him. Moses, obey what I'm telling you. Do what I'm telling you. So five times in this passage, God gives him a command, and Moses obeys every time, even as, even as crazy as it was to stop and pick up a snake by the tail. What was the occasion for this encounter with God for Moses? It was to call Moses to the work. This is not uncommon in the Old Testament pages, even in the New Testament. Isaiah had a vision as part of his work. Gideon, we already talked about all these men. Ezekiel, they were called by the Lord. And this encounter was just the beginning for Moses. But his life would never be the same. So what does this encounter teach us about God? Well, number one, it teaches us that we have a holy God. I mean, the fact that when God is present, the ground that he was walking on, that he was present around, became holy. What an amazing idea. And I wish we could do a whole lesson on uh, God's presence, making someone holy. And how, I mean, if you just for a real quick thought, you know, the Holy Spirit dwelling in me. If my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, what should I do with that temple? But number one teaches us that God is holy. Number two, and this is really the major thrust of the lesson as far as how I'm trying to uh, organize it. It's this, that the Lord is a God who cares. It's, the Lord is a God who cares. Verse 7 and 8 demonstrated that, right? He says, I have seen the affliction. He's heard their cry. He knows what they're going through. Verse 8, he's going to deliver them. Verse 8, he's going to bring them up into a new land. And then we come to verse 12, and we didn't go over this, so we want to real quickly look at this. Moses says, okay, God, so who do I tell them you are? And so who, what's your name? And, and it says here, notice what it says. What verse 12 says, but I will be with you. This shall be a sign that I have sent you. Uh, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Why was Moses having this encounter? Because God was calling Moses to go to the people. He was sending him to the people of Israel, to the Israelites dwelling in Egypt. And I want to read to you a quote from Brother Coy Roper. It says, God's reply probably reflects the name of God. I will be. It is similar in Hebrew to Yahweh. God was, listen to this, God was the answer to Moses' feeling of lacking worth and ability. He seems to say, I am with you. You have nothing to worry about. So God promises Moses, I'm going to be with you. My name should remind you of that presence. You know, we still encounter God today. We still encounter God today. And I'm not talking about in a vision. I'm not talking about in a burning bush. But we still encounter God today. We, this, we, and I don't mean, this seems so cliche, doesn't it? But this is how we encounter God. We encounter God through what is recorded in this book. And if I believe the things recorded in this book, I should be in this book. How, if, I, if you want to have an encounter with God, and you want to remove this from, from that process, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because this is how we encounter God today. We encounter Him. We're, we're see, we see Him working in the lives of His people throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, through the book of Acts. Constantly seeing God working, God having encounters with people. And we encounter them through this book. We also encounter God through prayer. And I know, man, it just seems so cliche to say, you know what? Here's the application today. Read your Bible and pray. It, it is extremely cliche, but here's why it's so cliche. Because it's absolutely the truth. Because if we want to encounter God, we can't encounter God outside of the Word of God. We, can't, we cannot encounter God without communicating with Him in prayer. That, th those are not just a, a, a part of what we do to, to encounter God. It, it is an absolutely foundation, fundamental aspect of encountering God. I would say this, I think we also encounter God through those around us, through brothers and sisters in Christ. I think we can encounter God in that way through the comfort, through the love that the church can, can pour out upon someone. We can encounter God through other Christians as well. But, but what I want you to see is that we can still encounter God today. And we need to be changed by that encounter, just like Moses was. And here's the other thing I want to bring back to our attention. This is really the thrust of this whole lesson. God, well, let me tell you this a little differently. God has encountered humanity throughout scriptures in various different ways, right? We saw that. Abraham, we didn't turn there, but in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, God encounters Abraham outside of a tent. Moses in a bush. Isaiah in the throne room of God. Uh, Hagar in the wilderness. The Apostle Paul, what did he teach? We have a God who actually is near each one of us. You know, while all these encounters in scriptures all serve different purposes, they all demonstrate something extremely important. So please listen to this. This is really the thrust of this lesson. Here it is and how beautiful it is. They all demonstrate this, that we have a God who wants to encounter us. He wants to encounter us. It's not crazy that we should want to encounter God, the creator of the universe. That's not crazy. That, that, to me, that makes sense. But what's amazing, what's mind-boggling almost, is that we have a God who wants to encounter us. You know, the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 8, he said, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, why do you care about me? When I consider what you are and who you are and what you've done, why, do you, why would you care about me? What is man, verse 4, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? But here's the beautiful thing. He is mindful of man. He does care for man. And he knows what we're going through. He sees us. He is a God who sees me. Let's make sure this week that we spend time encountering God. I appreciate your time and I appreciate this opportunity to be with you. God bless.